At this year's Summer A&A show in Los Angeles, we were able to gather three of the leading names in numismatics for an informal yet extremely informative roundtable discussion. Legendary numismatists David Bowers, Dave Sundman, and Ken Goldman were generous with their time and insights, sharing some great stories. When we asked them to compare what the A&A show was like 40 years ago to what it is today, and to share stories about some of their favorite coins, they really got rolling. David Bowers is a prolific, renowned numismatic writer. He has written dozens of award-winning books on rare coins. David Sundman from Littleton Coin Company has handled some of the largest and most significant coin hoards in history. He has bought and sold millions of individual coins to his global customer base. Kenneth Goldman is recognized as one of the most talented and knowledgeable individuals in the coin market. Some of the greatest minds in numismatics have referred to him as a walking encyclopedia. It was a privilege and a pleasure for me to be able to act as a moderator among such numismatic leaders as these. This is a discussion we know you'll enjoy. Hi, I'm Jaime Hernandez. I'm here at the ANA show with three veterans, um, Dave Bowers, David Sundman, and Kenneth Goldman. Thank you all, first of all, for joining us and taking the time to talk to us. Thanks, Jaime. Can you, uh, you know, let's go with Dave first. Can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, the ANA as far as go back, you know, 40 years ago? What's it like now today compared to 40 years ago? Well, today the ANA is big business, conventions big business. We're in the convention center of one of the world's largest cities. My first show was 1955 in Omaha, Nebraska, where we were in a hotel ballroom. Uh, and they, they announced at the end of the show that an all-time record had been achieved. And this includes dealers and their assistants. 500 people had come to the convention. <laughs> well, today, probably in 2009, there are probably uh, uh, 2,000 dealers and their assistants alone. So not, things have changed quite a bit. There were no uh, security room. Uh, there, were, there were no uh, uh, people with bid and There was no such thing as bid and ask. And, and you actually had to be a Numismatist. If you're going to deal in uh, in territorial gold, for example, you needed to know what a Clark Gruber $20 gold piece was and whether it was genuine. And today, uh, because of certification and uh, more information, uh, you don't need to know as much. But on the other hand, the plus of that is that you can deal in more. I could I can authoritatively deal in uh, a, a Swiss coin I don't know much about if it's in a say a PCGS holder and it's properly attributed because I can say I know what the grade is, but I don't have to have the technical knowledge. So things have changed that way. Right. David, when was your first ANA show and how has it changed from 30 years ago? I, uh, it probably was 30 years ago. I, when was Boston? And, uh, 1982. 1982. And then it was 1973 before 73, that. 73, Boston was uh, the first show that I went to. and uh, It was a whole new world to me because we grew up in a very tiny town, 6,000 people, and we were mail order coin dealers. And so we had no need to really go to shows. Yeah. And uh, my brother was our buyer at the time, and he said, we've got to get out there, find out what's going on. And it was the right thing to do. Uh, but it was a much more relaxed uh, show than I, I, I think in Boston in 73 than it, than it uh, grew to be in the uh, 80s and, and 90s. Uh, this show is a little bit quieter, quieter than the norm, but it's still a very important show, and we've had a good show here buying. We come to shows just to buy. Okay. Kenneth, uh, when was your first a, a show, and what was it like compared to this show here in 2009? First a, a I went to was 1968. It was in San Diego, not too far from here. I was 15 years old, so my, my father came with me just to keep an eye on me. I think as I was talking to Dave a little while ago, I think there's four or five people that I remember that are here today that were at that show, Dave being one. And through the years, I've seen a lot of interesting things. I remember at that show, there was a man named George Fonda from New York. He had an original roll of $3 gold pieces. I've never seen one before, and I've never seen one since. But one of the more interesting conventions I went to out here was, I think in 1976 or 1977, and I'd been going to shows now about oh, 10, 12 years, including the local ones in Boston. And I, got, I knew Michael Brownlee from Dallas, Texas very well. One of the more interesting things that happened is Michael called me and said, hey, Ken, come here, I want to show you something. 
He said, I got a coin in my pocket that'll make the whole coin show stop. And Michael was always pulling kind of pranks on me. So I said, okay, Michael, what do you got? So he pulls an envelope out of his pocket and he says, here, Goldman, look at this. So it's an envelope marked as, I recall, 1897S $20 gold piece. So I opened the envelope and I turned it over and a St. Gordon's 20 came out. And I said, what's so great about this? The reverse was facing up. So I took the 20 and I turned it over. It was a 1933 $20 gold piece. That coin is the mystery coin that's mentioned in David Tripp's book. It's not the one that sold at the Sotheby's auction. But if you look in David Tripp's book, there's an anonymous undated photo there of a 1933 $20 gold piece, which the government contends never got out. Well, I had that one in my hand. That was one of the more interesting things that happened to me. And I talked to Dave and Rick quite a bit because some of these old stories, people just wouldn't believe or wouldn't have the concept today. They say, well, you couldn't have had one in your head. Wow. Or you couldn't have seen a roll of $3 gold piece. Well, they were all there. It was a different world. It was much more gentle. Uh, a lot more was done on a handshake, but as David said, there was no certification. But kind of like back then, I remember talking to people like Abner Kreisberg and Jerry Cohen and Abe Kossoff, and you'd hear stories like this. Well, I guess today we're the ones telling the stories. <laughs> <laughs> now, David, yeah. uh, is there any interesting points that stick in your mind? Uh, as Ken was telling the story, I, of course, I, we weren't in the league that he was in. I, I would never see a 3320, but I, my dad used to advertise to buy 9S VDB. Pennies, and, and maybe we were paying five dollars or eight dollars a piece or something like that. And a lady from California sent in a roll, and we opened it up, and it was an original roll. They were all beautiful, uncirculated, light golden color. And I can remember my dad putting the roll in my hand. Of course, today you wouldn't put it in your hand, but he wouldn't spreading out the coins, and it made a big impression on me. And the other thing that was interesting was that he wrote back to the lady and says. We can't pay you five dollars a piece, and she's because they're uncirculated. And she wrote back and said, "I insist. You advertised five dollars a piece. I want five dollars a piece." So we we bought the roll, and uh, but I'd like to have it today because I I, I think today what would that be worth today? Oh, it's certainly into six figures. Six figures easily, yeah. easily. Yeah, it's, it's unimaginable. No so, one but it's just yeah. fun to think that you you saw it because not too many people saw an original roll. It, it was even scarce in the fifties. Oh, sure. Yeah. How many O9 SPDBs in any grade do you think Littleton has handled in their career? Well, it's a, thousands probably. Well, probably ten thousand. I mean, it's the biggest. It's. It, I mean, they're made almost half a million. So I'd, I'd say you know five to ten thousand to be considered. Wow. Now, yeah. David, uh, is there any interesting coins that stick in your mind that say, wow, you know, what, a, what a great coin, what are your favorite coins that you found? Well, uh, one of the first coins that I uh, bought, in, in 19, uh, I studied early proof coins and late proof coins in the 1950s, and at the first convention that I mentioned, uh, Omaha in 1955, they had an auction and they had an 1867 shield nickel with rays in proof grade. And uh, I had studied proof coins, and here I still a little teenager, and said, gosh, there hasn't been one of these sold for quite a while. And I put up my hand and I bought it for $510. And, and uh, the idea of, a, of a, a kid who was not old enough to belong to the ANA paying $510 for a nickel, and other dealers said, well, it's not worth that. And, uh, uh, was, was sensational. But maybe even more sensational, in 1955, there was a gentleman named Aubrey Beebe who had the auction that year, and he was in Omaha, and uh, he came by and he said, you know, you probably have never seen this stupid coin dealer in your life, but you're gonna meet one. He says, see this coin. And it was a 1796 quarter dollar with proof mirror surface. He said, you know, I know it's called me stupid, but I just paid $200 for this, but it's so nice. And uh, I said, well, that's very nice, Mr. Beebe. I mean, today that coin would be worth $200,000.